This horrific zombie-like footage shows Matthew Sean Murphy being tased on Duval Street. Four years ago, those faithful five seconds at 50,000 volts landed him in critical condition at a Miami hospital. He's been there ever since, in a vegetative state, unable to walk, talk, or even eat on his own. This week, California attorney Peter Williamson, famous for securing multi-million dollar verdicts in taser-related injury cases, has filed a lawsuit on his behalf against KWPD and Officer Mark Syracuse, who fired the taser that night. It was 3.40 a.m. Matthew Murphy and his fiancée, Marie Annalise, were walking back home when they were stopped by a local couple, Jason Moffitt and Beverly Anderson. It was like the white guy, he had long hair, and he said, uh, nigga lover. And I turned around, I was like, I was so shocked, like, nigga lover, like, I've only seen this on TV, like, I've never, I've never in my life had anybody said that to me, made me feel like that. The time, 3.41 a.m. Okay. And we got a bunch of goddamn fucking niggers out here fucking starting some shit with me and my dog. I'm fixing to go to my hotel room and they need to get the fuck out of here. We're right here in front of Wendy's on Duval Street. Okay. It was over the white guy being with a black girl. Which would have been what? Like, okay. She probably used nigger and... Right. I'm, I'm not sure. There's a white boy with a, with a nigger. I, I don't know. But I right. yes, Beverly instigated the... Right. So automatically Matt, you know, start like, you know, started arguing with him, you know, because you can't talk to my girl like that, like and then the girl, the lady that was holding the dog, she's like, I'm gonna beat your nigga girlfriend ass and then we all started arguing and then the dog started barking because people's arguing, he's gonna she like it's gonna bark. And then um, I'm in the middle of him like that. I'm standing in front of the guy, I'm like, calm down, it's okay, you said what you had to say, whatever, you know, and then I turn back, Matt is on the floor, and he's like this. You never heard the police say anything? I never heard the police say anything, like, because if he would have said, hey, what's going on, we both would have stopped, like, arguing, and we would have explained to him, like, they are being racist. In the morning, I started crying again, because I'm like, maybe it was a dream, eh? Jackson Memorial. Hospital called me like eight o'clock in the morning and say he's about to go in surgery. He had a brain bleed and they have to take a piece of his skull out. And not too high, but throw it up, throw it up. <laughs> you can't even do it. <laughs> Marie is now left alone, raising their son Caden, born just a few months prior to the incident. We were told that Matthew can still communicate by blinking his eyes. So we went along for a weekend visit at the hospital. We were not quite prepared for what awaited us. Matthew had just emerged from a bout of pneumonia induced by his total inability to move. The blinking of the eyes for yes and no certainly was not working out that day. His chart said, vegetative state. Okay. He's 28 years old. I don't think I'll ever have him back again. According to Amnesty International, tasers had already caused over 500 deaths by February of 2012. In a 60-minute interview, Rick Smith, co-owner of Taser International, explains the inevitable random risks of a taser blast. On the cases where taser clearly caused a death, and there's over a dozen of them, and those are injuries related to falls, where the taser caused a fall, some of them from a high place, 
Some of them from people standing on the ground and people fall down. Some of them are going to hit in just that absolute wrong way and sustain a lethal head wound. So, how does one define the reasonable use of a weapon that is safe most of the time, but can still maim or kill at random? 19-year-old Danielle Modesley did not survive. To address the rather unpredictable effects of taser use, the manufacturer and legislators have tailored a new legal concept. They shift the liability from the user to the victim. As long as the victim has been given an opportunity to choose not to be tased, he or she must assume all the consequences of a taser blast. In fact, Florida has adopted this concept. An officer can only fire his taser when a suspect is actively resisting the officer. Oh my goodness! So here comes the multi-million dollar question. Was Matthew Murphy given a choice? Did he actively resist the officer, as is claimed by KWPD? Or was he fired upon without even knowing the officer was there? This is Jason Moffitt the man who was arguing with Matthew Murphy warning, the night he was tased. He did not say that it was QSPD. He did not say cease and desist. He didn't say anything. He rolled up, tased the kid from the back. The child never got to see the officer, never knew that the officer was there, never knew what hit him. I'm Beverly Anderson. And the cop had came around the corner on a bicycle, and he didn't say stop, police, anything, nothing. He just pulled out the taser and taser. Could the kid have seen the, the officer? No. But you didn't see them coming? No. They came from behind you? Yep. They came from behind. They were behind Matt? Yep. They were not. But the chief of police claims that the officers issued multiple warnings. Uh, the officers responded to that situation and uh, were giving uh, verbal commands for the people to separate and stop fighting, and they refused to do so. One of the subjects were uh, tased. So who's telling the truth? Under KWPD policy, photographs must be taken of all taser probe entrance wounds. Those photos would clearly establish whether Murphy was tased from the front, as claimed by the officer, which would mean Murphy would have seen the officer, or the back, as reported by witnesses. However, the police department has informed the blue paper that no such photographs exist. In cases of serious injury, KWPD policy also requires that officers obtain statements from all bystanders. The officers took only two independent witness statements that night, neither give any indication as to whether Murphy knew of the officer's presence. Yet apparently, the incident drew a crowd. There was people across the street, there was people like like ahead of us and there was people right next to us, the two black guys right next to us. They didn't take a statement, they didn't take, they only took, I think, people across the street that didn't really hear much, they wouldn't talk to them. They, the police didn't, they, So the friend, Matthew's friend from Daddy Bone, they didn't, didn't take a statement. Nothing. And, and then the two, the two black, black gentlemen, they didn't take a statement either. They didn't take a statement. It's because the street was full. There were other witnesses to it. There would have been quite a few statements if there should have been quite a few statements. We weren't allowed to talk about it. Me and Jason both, we weren't allowed to talk about it. So Who told you not to talk about that? The police and everybody. The police told you not the to talk about it? The police said don't talk about it. Just leave it alone. All right. I'm not going to name no names, but yeah, back then they told us on the beach, Simonton Beach, just leave it alone. Don't talk about it. It was just a street fight. Nobody ever should have lost their life over an argument that was stupid.